we've got some incredible body tricks for you to show your friends. Now, the next one might get you all feeling a little sleepy. We're conducting a little experiment. We're going to yawn. Ugh. And just look what happens. That's one. Two. She's trying not to. Ugh. Oh, he's yawning again. Four. Five. Got you. Six, seven, eight, triple whammy. Are you yawning at home? It's a yawnorama. Is this boring? Hands up if you yawned. Me. So when we yawned, they yawned. Who thinks they've got a good explanation about why they yawned? I think yawning is um, a contagious disease because when one person does it, another person does it, then another person does it, and it just keeps on going. It's a good theory, Giuliano. We see someone looking tired and we think, I must be tired because they look tired. Another good theory, Charlie. So we've got all sorts of different explanations. And the really disappointing thing is that scientists and doctors don't know why we yawn. How about that? Look at that really cheated. Like, what? what? Well, it's true. The human body's an amazing thing, but sometimes doctors like us just don't know why things happen. Some experts think that yawning may have developed as a means of communication, telling everyone that you're tired, just like Charlie suggested. Or some think that when you're bored or tired, a big yawn will help you take in more oxygen, keeping you alert and awake. Whatever the reason, make sure you try this out on your mates. But don't do it when you're in class. You might get in trouble. <laughs> and now to the lab for some amazing body experiments. Ugh! Whoa! Just don't try anything you see here at home. <coughs> now today, we're going to be looking at what happens <coughs> when you cough. Now, a cough is a reflex action that your body does to get rid of something harmful or irritating which you breathed in by mistake, like icing sugar, for example. Icing sugar? Why would I breathe in icing sugar? We're in a lab, not a kitchen. And when I do bake, I always make savoury things, like, you know, the cheese twists with... <coughs> <coughs> Water! Now we're going to show you Chris coughing like you've never seen it before. Now this is a video of the inside of my head. This was taken using a magnetic resonance imaging machine, or MRI. Now, the main difference between a cough and simply breathing out hard is my favourite body part, your epiglottis. Its normal <coughs> job is to stop food going into your lungs <coughs> when you swallow, but in a cough, it closes <coughs> off the lungs and allows <coughs> pressure to build up in the lungs. Zond, do the first part of a cough. Now, Zond's closed his epiglottis, the pressure's rising in his chest, so when he opens it, <coughs> the air rushes out at 60 miles an hour. But if a cough's that powerful, where does it go? And what's in it? Well, we're going to show you. It's time for competitive <coughs> coughing. What is going on? Well, I've made these cutouts that look just like you and me. They don't and look they... anything like me. They're all blue. I'm the green twit. Everything I wear is green. It's greenish. It's... it's... Look, does that look the same? It's turquoise! It doesn't look anything alike! It's not relevant, Sand. The point is, I've put plates full of a special scientific gunk called agar jelly on the faces of our cutouts. So if any bacteria happen to land on any of our plates, they're going to multiply so much we can actually see them. OK, Chris, you ready? Three, two, one, cough! We're doing two experiments, one where the plates are 10 centimetres away and another where they're 50 centimetres away. <coughs> well, all done. Not quite, Chris. I want you to take this agar plate and hold it in front of your face, and I'm going to cough on it. And this time, I'm going to cover my mouth with my elbow the way you're supposed to, and hopefully no germs should land on the plate. OK, we'll just make sure you do it properly. <coughs> <coughs> and now we have to wait. In lab conditions, bacteria take some time to grow. Luckily, we came prepared for a long wait. And finally, the test results are in. 
So let's check out the cutouts that were 50 centimetres away first. Oh, yuck! This has worked really well. All these bacteria have grown into thick, furry, yucky blooms. Ugh. Well, let's have a look at mine. Ugh! They're even worse than Zod. Mine are also growing in horrible, slimy, furry green colonies. And all this from just one cough. Now for the cutouts that were only 10 centimetres away. Oh, this is even worse. There's loads of furry stuff in here. Oh, that is disgusting. Let's have a look at mine. Oh, there's a huge bacterial splat in the middle of the plate. I must have coughed off a lot of saliva with that one. So this is like coughing into someone's face when they're right next to you. And that's bad news for them when you realise that the average cough has 20,000 viruses in it. Which brings me to our last result. Let's have a look at the plate where I covered my mouth and coughed at Chris. Oh, two bacteria. I knew you hadn't covered your mouth properly. I think you can see, though, that this is a lot better than the other ones we did. So, there you have it. In case you were in any doubt about whether or not to cover your mouth when you cough, we've shown that not only could your cough reach the person right next to you, but it could travel a lot further than that. Yuck. And as well as seeing how far they travel, we've shown you just how much bacteria there can be in coughs. Well, there's a lot more in yours than in mine, Chris. You should see a doctor. Maybe I should. Better go find one. Ready to see some amazing experiments? Yes! A triumph! It can get a bit gross, but we're going to show you how your incredible <laughs> body works. Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today, we're looking at diarrhoea. Chris, you haven't seen my diarrhoea sample anywhere, have you? I can't find it anywhere. Oh, here it is. Now, let's get on with today's experiment, shall we? Have you got your sample? Well, that isn't very runny. I thought we agreed on diarrhoea. Look, I just thought it might be better to compare a normal solid poo with a runny one. Now, everyone gets diarrhoea from time to time, and one of the most common reasons is if you get a tummy bug, and the result is that your body ejects the contents of your digestive system as quickly as possible. Now, as you can see, Chris's plain solid poo looks completely different to mine. But that isn't the only difference. One of these poos weighs more. So which of them do you think weighs more? Chris's solid poo or Zahn's runny poo? As you can see, my diarrhoea poo is a lot heavier than Chris's normal poo. But why? Why is diarrhoea heavier and runnier than normal poo? Well, we're going to show you. Oh, Zand, welcome to my poo factory. Wow! Wait a minute! Are these my ballet tights? Yes, I'm just using them as part of the poo factory, and they are proving to be very, very effective fake intestines. But don't worry, don't worry, you can have them back later. First up, let's make a solid poo. Get the masher. And mash. This bowl is like the inside of your mouth chewing up the food. To help mash it up, your body adds saliva, enzymes, and it's all washed down with a drink. OK, Zan, I think that's enough. It's time to move it from the mouth to the intestines. This is like you swallowing. <laughs> Must work. Once the mashed up food hits your intestines, the muscular walls of your gut push the food along and squeeze out all the goodness. So you can see this rich liquid full of all the nutrients and the water is coming out of the guts and going into the body, which is these metal trays. And what's left is the indigestible stuff that's going to become your poo. Well, Zan, I think it's time to poo. There you go. Much, much more solid than it was at the beginning. Nice, dry, well-formed poo. We have made the perfect poo. And look how much water is in the tray. Our fake intestines managed to get almost all the water out of our poo. This water, full of nutrients, gets reabsorbed back into the body and delivered to where it's needed. So, if that's what happens to make a normal poo, what happens when you make diarrhoea? Well, it all starts in the same way. Right, Zond, put the food in the mouth and start chewing. 
just as before, we have the same food and mixture. But this time, our poor intestines are dealing with a tummy bug. Time to swallow. So now something different happens. The tummy bug makes your guts draw in extra water from your body, pushing everything through your system super fast. What I've got here is a high-pressure hose, and I'm going to use this to demonstrate what happens when your guts draw in water from your body. Chris, are you ready? I am ready. Three, two, one, go! Here it comes. Oh, that's good, Zond. That's good. Oh, look at that. <laughs> that is amazing, Zond. <laughs> oh, that's enough. Zander's turned my perfect poo factory into the world's first diarrhea machine. So, we've shown you that diarrhea is heavier and runnier than normal poo, as your intestines don't get the chance to do their job. And all the water that should have been absorbed, like the normal poo, ends up in the toilet. And you can see that in our trays. There's almost no water in our trays at all with the diarrhea. And that's why it's also a good idea to drink plenty of water or rehydration drinks when you have diarrhoea, because they replace the nutrients and water your body has lost. Speaking of drinks, all this experimentation is making me thirsty. Chris, I'm not sure you want to be drinking that. That's my backup diarrhoea sample. Uh... Ouch! And now to our lab. Ouch! For some amazing body experiments. Oh. Just don't try anything you see here at home. Ooh, spaghetti bolognese, my absolute favourite. Done. Yes, sir. This is delicious, by the way. It's not for you, it's for our experiment. But it's tasty, and I'm hungry. Look, you can have some later, perhaps, but I want to talk about food now. Because every year, you eat about 500 kilograms of food, and that's enough to fill two bathtubs to the brim. Why are you keeping food in the bath? Food goes in the fridge. If you keep the food in the bathtub, where do I have a bath? In the fridge? Look, Zond, no one's interested in your kitchen bathroom confusions. Now, you don't just eat food because it tastes good. Your body is actually an amazing energy conversion machine. So it's constantly turning what you eat into energy, even when you're asleep. And you use the energy from this food for all sorts of things, which is why I need this spag bowl, Zond. Now, watch. You use up to 75% of every meal for things like breathing, circulating blood and growing. Are you trying to make a pie chart out of spaghetti bolognese? Why don't you use a pie? Well, I, I had a pie for this very job, but it just vanished from the fridge. I hate it when that happens. Then 10% of what you eat is used up simply to digest what you've just eaten. I think that's a little bit more than 10%, Chris. I'll just adjust it for you. The remaining 15% is used up doing things you choose to do. Whether it's watching Operation Out, walking your dog, or playing with your mates. But how does your body turn your food into energy? Well, we're going to show you. In order to release chemical energy from food, your body has to combine it with oxygen from the air. That's why you breathe. Now, we've got pure oxygen here. Now, we also have one digestive biscuit here, and then the same weight of pasta. Now, they might be the same weight, but they give your body different types of energy. We're going to release the energy from both the pasta and the biscuit so you can see the different levels of energy you get from each. First up, pasta. And I'm going to soak it in this liquid oxygen. Inside your body, when oxygen and food are combined, a chemical reaction happens naturally. But outside the body, we need to ignite the chemical reaction using fire. Now, we're using special equipment to do this experiment in our lab, so don't even think about trying this at home. It's a terrible way of cooking pasta, especially after you did such a nice job with that spaghetti. Zond, it's not a cookery show. This is about energy. Pasta releases energy in your body slowly and steadily, just like the small, steady flame burning here. But how will the digestive biscuit compare to the pasta? Will it, A, release more energy, or B, less energy. Let's find out. Ready? Whoa! <laughs> now that burns in quite a different way to the pasta. So yes, the massive flame shows that our biscuit does immediately release more energy, 
but don't be fooled by our action replay. It's for a shorter amount of time. It's why you might immediately perk up after eating something sweet, but then have a slump soon after. You've ruined it. I was really looking forward to that. This is a complete disaster. I think it was a great success. So, while we get energy from all the food we eat, some foods like pasta release it slowly, while other sweet foods deliver a quick but short-lived energy burst, which isn't much use if you want to get through the day. And so digestive biscuits should only be enjoyed as a treat. Isn't that right, Sand? <laughs> Okay, everybody, welcome to Team Zahn. I'm going to turn you into the greatest basketball players this country has ever known. Are you ready to give it 100%? Yeah! My team is still one player short, so I have three players to choose from, and I want to use all of you guys to help me pick one of them. Okay, so who thinks they know which of the three available Dr. Chris's we should pick for my team? Lola? That one. Why? Because he, like, reached over everyone. OK, Pavel. Top one. The top one, that guy on the left. Yeah, so because if you're taller, you can run faster. So everyone in Chris's team has chosen this player as he looks tall. But who will Zahn's team pick? OK, team, now, before you vote, remember, we want them to get a terrible player. Pick the worst one. Three at the back, what do you think? Foot right. Why did you say I should pick in the bottom right? Because he's small. Are you sure you're not just trying to pick me the worst player so that you win? Yeah. Hmm. Zahn's team chose Dr Chris on the right. Let's take them both off the board and see which one is tallest, Chris. Lola and Wajid, can you put the two Dr Chris's on top of each other? Can you see they are exactly the same size. So what's going on? You use your magic. You think I use magic, Aziz? There's no magic here. Now, because the drawing... It's a perspective drawing. What we're doing is we're looking into a room and this bit of the room is small and it's far away, whereas this bit of the room is near to us. Everything, because it's further away from us, should be getting smaller. But because the Dr Chris doesn't get smaller, our brain assumes that this Dr Chris is bigger, even though we can show they're exactly the same size. Well, that was an amazing trick, Chris. And I'll tell you what, since you're still one player short, you can have Mr Grumbles. What? Well, that's not going to be any use. Well, they don't call him slam-dunking Grumbles for nothing. Here he comes! Get out of the way! 